So welcome everyone. Uh, we have about 120 people registered to attend today, which is great to see. And I will say just privately, one of the people registered is Jenny Morgan, who was my university lecturer who started me on the journey today. I, in 1990, I studied discrimination law and feminist legal theory, and she opened my eyes to a whole lot of things that we're going to be talking about today. Um, so I'll start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land where we're all located. I'm presenting from the lands of the Boonarung people of the Kulin Nation out of Melbourne. And I invite you to take a moment to pay your respects to the traditional owners in your location. I'm Kate Jenkins. I'm the Australian Sex Discrimination Commissioner. This is one of a series of webinars that we're holding on my recently released Respect at Work report on the National Inquiry into Sexual Harassment in Australian Workplaces. And today's focus is on the implications for academics and those in the university sector. And because of the specialisation of today's audience, I'll also be talking about my national report on sexual assault and sexual harassment at Australian universities. I've got a few publications called Change the Course. Uh, so please be aware that the session is being recorded and will be available uh, to share with others in the next week. I hope you'll think it's so fantastic. You will want to share it around. We're mindful that people listening to this webinar might find the content distressing. So please remember that there are support services available should you need them. You can call 1800 RESPECT or 000 if you're in immediate danger. Uh, I suggest that you might like for the start of the webinar to use the speaker view function that will have the main speaker, so it will be me and then Brian and Marion, but then we'll move to the gallery view so you can look at all of us while we're um, running the session, the Q&A section. Um, and I'm looking forward to your questions. I encourage you to send through your questions on the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. So first I'll start with some uh, brief introductions. I'm really delighted that Professor Brian Schmidt, the Vice-Chancellor of the Australian National University can join us today. Particularly Brian has been a strong leader in addressing sexual harassment at the Australian National University, including taking a strong yet humble position in response to change the course in, in 2017, and also actively supporting our national inquiry on sexual harassment. So Brian, I'll just pass for a minute so that uh, people can see and know that you're there. Would you like to just introduce yourself briefly? Uh, sure, thank you, Kate, and welcome everyone. Thank you for your acknowledgement to country. I'm on Ngunnawal Nambri uh, land here uh, in Canberra and I pay my respects to elders past and present. So you can tell from my accent, I grew up in the United States. I actually grew up in rural regions of Montana and Alaska. And uh, I guess I had a very strong mother and I had a very strong grandmother uh, who were feminist well before uh, feminism was really a term used. Uh, and so it's always been something natural to me is that uh, equality should be there and I sort of realized coming to run the university that it, I had a chance to make sure it really is there and that things like sexual harassment uh, are just stamped out because as normalized behaviors, which I, I'm sorry to say they are in our communities, uh, it is only through a broad sweeping measure that we're going to actually change the course as you say uh, and be an institution that I am proud to, to be part of. And so it's a very important thing to me personally. Thank you, Brian. And I'm also very pleased to be joined today by Professor Marion Baird, uh, Professor of Gender and Employment Relations and presiding pro-chancellor of the University of Sydney. And if you can see behind her, she has her um, proper panel that will say all of those things on it. Marion played a crucial role in the inquiry as a member of our reference group and, uh, and also particularly helping us with the survey with Sarah Charlesworth as well. And so I want to take a chance to thank you, Marion, for your invaluable assistance in that role through the inquiry. And I'll pass to you just to introduce yourself briefly. I 
Thank you, Kate. I wish to acknowledge that I'm joining this webinar this afternoon from um, the land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. That's the land on which the University of Sydney campus is built and I pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. And it was a great privilege to be part of this, um, of both preparing the survey and the inquiry. And I um, give credit to you, Kate, and your team for the excellent report, which we'll have some opportunity to discuss. I, I'm um, head of the discipline of work and organisational studies in the University of Sydney Business School. And I'm also co-director of the Women and Work Research Group. Um, I co-direct that with my wonderful colleague, Professor Ray Cooper. And uh, I think that sort of says it all. I haven't always experienced equality in my working life, but I've been really keen to research women and work and how they have combined their responsibilities generally as carers with work over the life course. And so um, the work that you did in this report and that I know many Australians um, and our university colleagues are very eager to hear about um, has been very important. And um, it's a delight to be here and I'm looking forward to the discussion as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. So the format we'll follow is I'll make some opening remarks, which will be really a summary of the key aspects of the report that particularly have relevance for universities and academics. And then I'll pass to Brian and then Marion to make some of their own reflections. And then we'll open, as I said, for a Q&A with any participants, any questions you'd like to deliver. So just starting as a quick refresher, uh, I'll just remind you of the definition of sexual harassment. Let's really start at those basics. So at its basic, uh, at simplest, it's sexual harassment is unwelcome conduct of a sexual nature, which reasonably causes the person harassed to be offended, humiliated or intimidated. That's the definition under the Sex Discrimination Act. It's been largely the same over the period since 1984 with some changes um, and in particular, when we look at that change, the course focused on sexual harassment and sexual assault of students at universities, while respect at work focused on sexual harassment at work. Uh, so if I start first with change the course, which we launched in 2017, it's just actually past its third birthday. Change the Course was based on the results of a 2016 national survey of 30,000 students across Australia. It was based on almost 2,000 submissions made to the Australian Human Rights Commission, the largest number of submissions we've ever received on a single piece of work. Change the Course had some disturbing findings. One in five students were sexually harassed at university in 2016 and 1.6% of students were sexually assaulted in a university setting in 2015 or 16. 94% of students who were sexually harassed and 87 of those who were sexually assaulted did not make a formal report or complaint to their university. And one of the most common reasons for not reporting was that people did not know where or who to report to. Now you, this audience will know that this was a survey that all 39 universities willingly participated in. And also as, as a result, the recommendations that came out of it have been actively responded to by the universities. So the recommendations we made were in five key areas. First was that universities make a strong and visible commitment to action engage more effectively with students and implement recommendations clearly and transparently. The second was that universities undertake targeted education campaigns aimed at changing attitudes and behaviours. The third was that universities improve their responses to sexual assault and sexual harassment, including ensuring that students have access to specialist support. We also recommended monitoring and evaluation of measures taken to ensure that they are evidence-based and that improvements are made over time. And finally, in relation to residential colleges, we recommended an independent expert-led review to identify measures to address the high prevalence rates of sexual assault and sexual harassment in that setting. 
And I'm pleased to report that all universities accepted most of the recommendations. And in fact, most of them accepted all the recommendations and are we working to implement them? And those efforts have been regularly audited by the Tertiary Education Quality Standards Agencies and the Australian Human Rights Commission. The NETS National Survey of University Students is slated for next year and will allow us to check in on progress five years since the first survey. And I particularly uh, note that it was a fantastic step that all 39 universities uh, decided voluntarily to publish their own results. Uh, and we'll get to some of the conversation about the importance of that transparency as a, an important step to progress. So Change the Course covered the harassment and assault of university students. However, sadly, we know that sexual harassment also occurs in the world of work. But until recently, we knew very little about its actual nature, drivers and impacts in Australia. For that reason, in 2018, we commenced a national inquiry into sexual harassment in Australian workplaces. The inquiry had the support of government, unions and employers, as well as the extra energy off the back of the global Me Too movement, which placed a renewed spotlight on the prevalence of sexual harassment at work. The goal of the inquiry was to examine the nature, prevalence and drivers of sexual harassment in Australian workplaces and measures to address and prevent it. Our Respect at Work report is the culmination of 18 months of work involving a survey of 10,000 workers, 60 public consultations with, with 600 participants, 460 written submissions, global research and economic modelling. And I launched Respect at Work alongside the Minister for Women, Senator Maurice Payne, on Friday the 6th of March 2020. Uh, many of you will remember right that around that time when the world started to change. Minister Payne and the Attorney General Christian Porter welcomed the report and said the Australian Government will carefully consider its recommendations. And they also at the same time underline the government's commitment to ensuring Australian workplaces are safe and free from sexual harassment. Many participants in the inquiry shared with me their devastating experiences of sexual harassment at work and the inadequate responses they experienced. And I guess for me most heartbreaking was the long term harm and financial hardship caused to many by the experience, which is often, I think, invisible to workplaces who move on while those workers leave or change um, careers. Uh, we found that sexual harassment is a common experience. Our survey and the inquiry told us that workplace sexual harassment is pervasive. It occurs in every industry, in every location and at every level in Australian workplaces. In 2018, one in three Australian workers had experienced workplace sexual harassment in the last five years, and that's up from one in five workers in 2012. We found the current system places the onus on the victim to complain, and yet only 17% of people who said they were sexually harassed at work actually did make a complaint. We found that sexual harassment happens in all workplaces. And uh, for the first time, we collected industry specific data across 21 ABS defined industry sectors, which provides a valuable resource for industry action. And in terms of students, uh, again, the Change the Course survey and the next survey is similarly valuable. And finally, we found that sexual harassment has a high cost. Deloitte Access Economics modelled the economic cost of workplace sexual harassment for the inquiry, and they estimated that workplace sexual harassment costs the Australian economy, I'll say conservatively, $3.8 billion in 2018, with 70% of that borne by employers. Uh, so clearly we've got a problem about sexual harassment in Australia. And the inquiry showed us that the current system for addressing workplace sexual harassment is complex and confusing for victims and employers. Our inquiry revealed an urgent need to shift from the current reactive complaints based approach to one that requires positive action from employers and had a focus on prevention. 
And so our respect of work report proposes a new approach which builds upon Australia's existing policies and initiatives through 55 recommendations which fall under five areas of focus. First, data and research to deliver useful industry-based information about the nature of sexual harassment and effective responses. Second, primary prevention of sexual harassment through education, media and community-wide initiatives. Thirdly, a refocused legal and regulatory framework which recognises the mutually reinforcing roles of discrimination, workplace and safety laws. Fourth, better workplace prevention and responses which are lead and driven, practical and adaptable. And finally, better support, advice and advocacy for people who experience sexual harassment and which I know for students has been a focus of work across universities since 2017. So for today's webinar, I'll focus on the specific recommendations that are most relevant to the work of academics and those in the university sector. So if I start with data and research, the inquiry revealed that there are still evidence gaps in our knowledge on sexual harassment. And as you know, a lack of hard evidence impedes effective policy making. So we made some recommendation designed to improve the evidence and which I hope will stimulate the work of academics in this area. Australia has the unique benefit of four national surveys conducted approximately every four years since 2003, supported by, as I've said, academics such as Marion Baird, Sarah Charlesworth and Paula MacDonald. We recognised that the Commission continue, or we, sorry, we recommended that the con Commission continue to conduct a national survey every four years with further refinements. And this data will allow us to identify trends over time, assess the effectiveness of our responses and develop further evidence-based policy interventions. And in fact, our survey is a bit of the envy of the world. We also recommended that agencies which handle workplace sexual harassment matters agree a de-identified data set relating to workplace sexual harassment and create a coordinated system of annual reporting on workplace sexual harassment metrics and establish formal information sharing and data exchange arrangements. I know some of you will be very excited about that having been in the Victorian Commission role um, getting information that covers all the state and territories and across jurisdictions, including safety and fair work, has been very difficult and don't we know it. Uh, lastly, we recommended that a national sexual harassment research agenda be de developed to identify priorities for sexual harassment research and contribute to a national evidence base on sexual harassment. I'm pleased that Anne Rose, the Australian National Research Organisation for Women's Safety, has started pulling this together. A key finding from our inquiry was that tertiary education institutions need to play a bigger role in primary prevention. The education system is a critical setting for primary prevention as it has a very broad reach to young people. During the inquiry, we found that young people generally had poor knowledge of sexual harassment and were at higher risk of suffering sexual harassment. Universities and other tertiary education institutions have an avenue to directly influence attitudes on gender inequality and shift social norms during the critical transition from school to work or career change. In respect at work, the Commission recognised the extensive work universities were already undertaking to give effect to the change the course recommendations. However, during the inquiry, we also heard that tertiary education institutions could play a more active role in supporting primary prevention efforts. Universities in particular have many tools at their disposal, including the potential to drive whole of campus activities linked to professional development for relevant university educators and reach a number of businesses who are on site at the university. In respect to work, we recommended that universities and other tertiary education institutions build on the work already underway in response to the recommendations in Change the Course to deliver evidence-based information and training on sexual harassment for staff and students. The training should address the drivers of gender-based violence and include content on workplace rights. We also recommended that 
the government supports smaller tertiary and higher education providers to implement this recommendation, for example, through the Tertiary Education Quality Standards Authority or the Australian Skills Quality Authority. As well as educating young people and staff about what to expect when they enter the workforce, tertiary education institutions are also, of course, themselves places of work. So I wanted to mention the new workplace prevention and response framework envis envisaged in respect of work. The new framework provides a more holistic approach that looks beyond policies, training and complaint handling procedures. It has seven areas of focus. To better prevent sexual harassment, we need strong leadership, a greater focus on risk assessment and transparency, an organisational culture of trust and respect, and better workplace training. To better respond to sexual harassment, we need improved support to workers throughout the reporting process, increased reporting options, and better measurement and data collection at the workplace and industry levels. To embed this new framework within Australia, we recommended that industry and profession-wide initiatives be established to address sexual harassment. Initiatives may include industry-specific prevalence surveys, codes of practice, accreditation requirements, or awareness raising campaigns. Universities are particularly well placed to implement the industry-wide initiatives in response to respect of work to target their specific risk factors. Our report includes a number of university examples of promising practice that have been implemented following Change the Course, including the Respect Now Always program, engaging the Commission to undertake this student survey that resulted in Change the Course, establishing anonymous reporting lines and improving student support services. But there is more to be done <clears throat> and we know that universities as workplaces and educational institutions are characterised by a range of systemic risk factors, including male dominated leadership ranks, small and highly connected disciplines, significant power disparities, including reliance on a patronage system of training and advancement, conferences and events being part of uh, the work of an academic, short term contracts and casual work, and industry placements of students and academics, to name just a few. We've also identified the use of industry, state and federal awards and recognition programs as a key tool to incentivize industries to improve their approaches to workplace sexual harassment. There are some great examples of using awards and recognition programs to encourage positive organisational change in the academic sector such as the Science in Australia Gender Equality Awards. And some of you might know we actually did a webinar with SAGE earlier this year. So our world has changed dramatically since the report was tabled in Parliament on the 5th of March. The need to address sexual harassment hasn't lessened, but COVID-19 did change the immediate priority for our governments and many workplaces, and rightly so. However, sadly, we need to look no further than our daily headlines to see that sexual harassment is a problem that continues to need urgent attention, including in universities. While the government's official response to respect at work has been delayed, I think you'll agree that, ac that academics and universities already have in our comprehensive report the information they need to take action to create more productive, respectful and safe workplaces. Having said that, I also acknowledge the significant impact of COVID-19 on the university sector and completely understand the difficulty and the trauma facing the sector at the moment. So Brian, at this stage, I, I want to hand over to you to just hear some of your reflections on the report. And I encourage participants to continue to send any questions for us to answer shortly. Thanks, Brian. Thanks, Kate. Uh, so it, it is great to see uh, the foundational work that helps us uh, navigate this. This is, this is not easy and in academia, uh, I think it's fair enough to say that um, academic institutions are very slow to change and there has been entrenched normalized 
core practice within academia uh, that is intergenerational. Uh, and so a lot has happened over the last 25 to 30 years, uh, but it is still there, uh, albeit uh, probably um, not as much as it was as Kate when you were a student um, and when I was a student. For me, when I'm out looking, I see it, um, the, the issues around uh, sexual uh, harassment and um, uh, especially violence kind of fill different areas. So the one that changed the course was all about was student, student, student. And that is, remains my biggest issue by probably an order of magnitude, probably two orders of magnitude. Uh, Every year I have 5,000 new students arrive uh, who have to uh, get into, you know, they come from all sorts of backgrounds. And so it's just re replenishing, replenishing, replenishing the problem. Uh, they're young, uh, the normalized behavior, the way media and stuff uh, uh, portrays things is, is not helpful. So that remains uh, a major challenge. Staff student uh, is what historically, I think we know universities of having terrible, terrible practice. And that is the one that uh, I won't say it's completely resolved, but it's probably the one I'm most comfortable on in that uh, I, I would say I know almost all activity that occurs in the university now and it's acted upon. It's just not tolerated, it's denormalized. You, it doesn't mean I don't have to act on it, but I would just say it's pretty straightforward. Uh, and I think people understand it's out of bounds now. Staff staff is one that I don't hear too much about, and that worries me because I'm sure it occurs. But like student student, it is, I would say, normalized behavior. It's the, the normal the normalization is unclear. On the staff staff front, it's quite interesting because it uh, a thing that I, I see now emerging, where I do see problems cropping up quite often, isn't what I would describe as uh, sexual harassment, but I would describe it as gendered bullying. And I think, Marion, you were talking a little bit about that earlier before we started. And again, the norms were conflating academic freedom and the ability to talk things with what I would describe as a bullying, and it's often gendered based. And that is a, if I had to say amongst my staff, staff interactions, that is my biggest problem where I have the most damage I think being done because people are just not sure what to do about it. Uh, with respect to, for example, change the course, we talk about uh, leaders wanting to act. Well, that's pretty easy. It's, as a leader, you don't want to have this happening in your institution. You have responsibility, you want to act. So. Uh, I wouldn't say all leaders are as passionate about it as I am, but those who are, it's easy to stand up and no one's going to stand in your way. Uh, education to change attitudes. As I said, we have a whole wave of people who arrive new from all around the world, not just students, staff. Uh, it's important, but how do we effectively cut into that? That's a place where we need a lot more education and the generations change. You know, the current students are completely different than the ones five years ago. So it's an active, agile response that I don't think anyone's figured out how to do. And you know, what we did a couple years ago was kind of edgy and now it's seen as boring and no one's gonna pay attention. Oh, what are you doing? Uh, the responses to assault and sexual harassment, very challenging. You have a, uh, a situation where the confluence of um, people wanting an outcome to occur and some sort of due process conflating where you have a poor evidence base uh, and the knowledge that uh, you're not really working within a legal framework, you're working with an institutional one and it is hard. Uh, and I, I cannot underestimate how hard I find this. You're continually, in a space where you're not sure which, if you're in solid footing all the time. Uh, if you go through and think about, uh, you know, education and, and things, 
uh, that's, uh, again, I think fairly straightforward about, you know, how we go out and we market and we try to normalize, but again, it loses its effect pretty quickly. And then our residential colleges, the home of students' students. But I do want to indicate that from your report, if you looked at the rates of sexual violence especially, uh, yes, very high in residential colleges, but not obviously higher than outside in the, the homes of people off campus. It was just the question asked, where on university campuses? And as a university where half of our students live on campus, clearly I have a lot of activity on campus that are problematic. Uh, but I think one of the things that universities need to make sure they do is their students on and off campus are both protected. And we don't have a good handle on how to help people in their own share houses or stuff right now. And in some sense, I'm grateful to have my students on campus because I have responsibility, but that means I can act more effectively. So as a leader, this is hard. Um, taking responsibility, unfortunately, makes you a target for activists because every one of these cases are tragic. And when you go through and you use best practice, uh, best practice is not always appreciated by activists. They want outcomes, outcomes you cannot always deliver, unfortunately. And so many vice chancellors find it easier to be a small target, do little things on the side, because then you don't get targeted by the activists. So you really do need to stand up as a leader and just take it, but you will take it. And my hope is everyone will stand up and take it. So at least the pain is a little more evenly distributed. Uh, but um, sticking with best practice is really challenging. Uh, but as I said, as a leader, uh, the outcomes, and I see how uh, academia has students drop out for their detriment of the rest of their lives. You lose academics, uh, brilliant people, uh, crippled uh, about what they can do uh, because of terrible experiences. And when you realize that ultimately falls to you as a leader, um, it's not something you can shy away from. So I'll stop there. Thank you, Brian. Really helpful reflections. And even you joining this, uh, webinar I think tells us your commitment um, that you're prepared to talk about this. I know through the inquiry it did really surprise me how many corporate leaders were very hesitant to have anything um, connected with this issue to, connected to their names. So Marion I'll just pass to you for your reflections and, and thank you there's some great questions coming in keep them coming. Thanks very much Kate and um... Thank you, Brian. It was really interesting to listen to your reflections as a leader. I am a managing a large university with you, as you said, dealing with the student, 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 staff, staff, staff is, is situation, plus the external environment that universities are also now really probably responsible for and have to consider where their students are living and doing and what they're doing. Um, but I want to start, I suppose I come at it with a slightly different viewpoint because of where I sit in my institution, both as a researcher and a head of discipline. So not as senior, but also um, maybe really interested in the process of how we've got to where we got to and the report. And I begin with saying that I think the title of the report and the whole inquiry, Respect at Work, I'll just hold it up again, is actually really critical because research that I've done with Ray here and my colleagues um, in political economy and political science, I won't name everyone today, but we did a report on women and the future of work. And there were two issues that came out for women as the most important, um, what they considered to be the most important attributes of their workplaces. And the first one is respect, respect at work. So, that's what we're looking for, respect at work. And I think that issue, it goes beyond the notion of just physical or not just the importance of physical respect, but also the importance of respect for um, the value of the work they do and the contributions that they give. And so this in a way aligns with something that um, Brian raised 
that sometimes we really do have to think more broadly than sexual assault and harassment in our workplaces. So respect at work is critical. It's a critical, um, it's a critical um, part of our workplaces and something we should really aspire to and consider that all our policies and practices lead to that respect. Respect for all people, not just women in this context, but I'm focusing on women because of our topic. The second area I want to note is that data. Data and the um, availability of that data is really critical to identifying the problem, tracking the problem and how we um, maybe attend to it over the years and in our institutions. But as a research um, tool itself, the report is an enormous volume, but it's a really critical piece of material that we as academics can use. And I really would welcome um, and uh, encourage uh, our fellow colleagues to really read the report or at least dip into it and to the appendices as well, because just like a good PhD um, thesis, there's a lot of information in there that you can use in your own workplaces and in your own research and work. But I'm going to go to some research that we've done ourselves. And this is this issue, returning to this issue about sexual harassment and what do we mean by that. Kate put up the clear legal definition as it stands at the moment. And, and that's critical to what we were gathering information on and understanding what was happening in Australian workplaces, including universities. But in other research we've done, um, uh, and this is research that's recent, recently been published, um, Ray Cooper and I, Mariah Foley and Sarah Oxenbridge looked at um, the broader concept of gender-based harassment. And this we say is perhaps even more prevalent than sexual assault and sexual direct sexual harassment. And we define that as harassment that is not necessarily directly sexual in nature, but is targeted at individuals or women as a group because of their sex or gender. And this is where I think we have to be really careful and start looking at what is going on in our workplaces because demeaning, humiliating, disrespectful language and behaviour lead into an environment where, as Brian said, we start to normalise um, the disrespect in our workplaces. So, we, we are very conscious of um, attending to sexual assault and harassment on campuses, but I think we also should be really clear about how we respect each other in the workplace and how we treat each other in meetings, in classrooms, in all our relationships on campus. And to that regard, I'm, I'm really um, pleased to see that one of the recommendations from um, from Kate and the, and the team is to reconsider the objectives of the Act and to really um, make it more explicit that actions that create a hostile and intimidating environment be prohibited, because that is an area that we really need to attend to as well. Um, my final point will be to go to what has COVID done to, the, done to us and where are we now? Um, as Kate mentioned, the report came down almost the same week that we went into lockdown in many states. We moved away from our offices, those of us who could do that in the jobs we were in. And, and what does this say? Well, in times of recession, we know that previous research shows that in times of recession, gender equality can take a back backward step. It can be the issue that is disregarded, downplayed, ignored, rendered invisible again. So I think this time round, we have to be really aware of that. We have to make sure that we don't just pay atten attention to the concrete measures, and I'm using that slightly pun intended about um, shovel-ready projects, but we look at the social environment that we create post-COVID as well, in all our workplaces and in our society. So. Um, I think the lesson for us today, especially in a COVID, post-COVID, or as we come out of COVID really, environment is to ensure that gender harassment more broadly, including sexual assault and sexual harassment, is not tolerated. And that we continue to do the research that is needed, but also to work in our practices, in our everyday lives, to build respect in our workplaces in our universities, in our university environments, and in our classrooms. Now, Kate 
really has some interesting recommendations in the report about the way in which we can build this into our education. But of course, COVID has shifted the way we deliver education as well. And I think this raises a set of new challenges for us, ones that we really hadn't thought about before. Um, how do we build in um, that education and training when we're not teaching to um, our students face to face at the moment? That raises another challenge for us. And one I think we haven't really paid that much attention to as we've had to so quickly um, move to an online environment. So that's a lesson for me that I'll certainly take away into my own discipline, raise the issue of, we used to have standard, you know, um, this is the behaviour in the classroom, this is the behaviour in our university. I think that's dropped off the agenda a bit, so we have to bring that back. Um, the other issue, and we may, may talk about some of this in discussion more, but the other issue, of course, is that our workplaces are slightly more isolated environments now. And this is a concern because people could be at work where the bystander is not there. Now you make, a, you, know, you make some very good points in the report about the importance of bystander training, that bystanders should take action. But we're now in a situation where workplaces may only have a few people there at any particular time. So the isolation of our working environments is different as well. Um, so I, I think, you know, COVID, COVID's had, had a bit of a, a, it's had an impact in that the whole report was probably released and then overtaken, but it doesn't mean it should be forgotten. And we must return to these critical issues because they will be there, they are there, and we have to ensure that as we come out of COVID and our new educational environments, we are as cognizant of these challenges as we ever have been and respond to them. Thank you, Kate. Thank you. Um, reflections, great reflection, reflections from both of you. So I'll suggest participants, if you want to change to gallery view, then you can see us all at the same time. You might already be on that. Um, but so we'll go to some questions and I've got some really good ones there. And I'll confess to Marion and Ryan that I've I've sort of, I foreshadowed a starter question, but I've changed the question in my head. So be at the ready. Um, and really this is for both of you um, because it bounces off what you've said, but also what I'm seeing. If we go to the issue of sexual harassment, uh, particularly mindful of Brian's sort of description of the challenges of being uh, both visible, but also what I heard very consistently was your internal advisors will absolutely warn you against you know, please keep it quiet, get NDA signed, you know, keep it, you know, we don't want to be out there. Um, but my sense is that we have hit a moment and it is, uh, so Change the Course was delivered in August of 2017, the 5th of October, we're about to come to the three year anniversary of the Harvey Weinstein story that really cascaded the Me Too movement. So universities were actually ahead of that. Um, but I'm really interested in whether you think the tide is turning on this. So to some degree, I think we've seen a, a reporting, and I won't go to the individual facts of any cases, but we've seen reporting about the High Court, we've seen reporting about AMP, QBE, we've seen reporting about the University of Adelaide. Um, and those stories are folding on top of one another, and it does feel, whether it's workers, whether it's investors, that there is a different expectation. I just am wondering whether you can, and I guess I was a lawyer for a long time in this area, I, I'm visibly seeing there's a different expectation on leaders and organisations to be a bit more transparent. If Brian, can I start with you? Do you feel that or do you feel like it's not changed yet? Uh, but the fear of the, you, you know, that you will probably know male champions of change last week, and I was quite involved with that, did a report that had recommendations about balancing confidentiality and transparency. Do you think we're at a turning point or do you think we will um, just go back to how we handled sexual harassment in the past? Well, I think things are changing. But I think they're changing because the survivors are feeling empowered that they're not going to be crushed by the world. And when I look at all the cases, there was a lot of silencing 
in many of the cases you've just talked about. And that was not because it was acceptable practice. It was not acceptable practice. If I had seen any one of those people do that at any point of my career, I would have called it out and I would have gone and made a big kerfuffle about it. But I didn't see it. And so when it occurs, the people who have been affected about it uh, are in fear of their future livelihood because they don't trust the system to treat them fairly. And can I say with pretty good reason. So I think uh, now that the, the Me Too is sort of vigilanteism, you know, you wouldn't stand by and say, well, that's a great legal process. But it has forced, I think, some issues to be dealt with uh, by people like me, uh, where you need to sort things and deal with them, not always in a purely legal way, because you know there's no hiding anymore. So I think it will fix things, but because it's empowering people to feel that they have a recourse where they used to just say, my best solution is to remain quiet and move on with my life. I mean, if I, if I bounce off that, there are a couple of things in the uh, inquiry report that we came up with that I think responded to that situation is that people were concerned with good reason. The evidence shows the, you know, the effect on people's livelihoods. And, I, and I'm sort of folding in some of the questions with this discussion. So there's a particularly a good question discussing the significant power differentials between the ranks, the sort of the short-term precarious limited roles where you lack tenure, um, the people with, you know, from marginalised communities, so all the different uh, challenges there. I think there were two things that um, we particularly feel like are important for the next step. One is that you shouldn't just be waiting for complaints and relying on those, that we need to, shiver to pivot to prevention and prevention isn't responding just when, but actually understanding more broadly what's going on, where are the risk factors, how to, what's reported up the line, um, really actively governance and leadership taking a role. And the second, which I think goes to some of your um, experience of pain, because I've watched and I've seen you be quite vocal, but in the universities, that's not the norm. But if you do things as a university sector or as a legal sector, because the issues are systemic, they are not one bad university, then you kind of learn from each other, but you also stop this bad man, bad organisation kind of narrative and start moving to that prevention, you know, recognising the issue. Miriam, what did you think about turning point? Do you think we're at a turning point? I do. I do. And I, the people I talk to, and I'm not talking about um, my academic colleagues, the people I talk to at friends, friends of friends, events, many, many women are just fed up with the system and they want change and they're not going to put up with it any longer. So I think, I think the Me Too movement raised the issue, but the continual um, exposure of companies and their bad practices is infuriating people. And they are saying, we're not living in the 50s or whenever they thought this was appropriate, whenever it was appropriate behaviour, it's, it's time to change. And if you don't change, we're going to pull out our support. We're not going to buy your products. We're not going to invest in your companies. We're going, to make, we're going to make it loud and clear that we're not putting up with it anymore. So I do think it's changing. And I think we have to, as universities, be really aware of that, um, that we, we just can't not we we can't go any length and say we are to hide it or pretend it's not there um, but businesses corporate leadership have to act transparency is not just an issue in sexual harassment it's coming through in all sorts of areas of business now and and i do think in that respect the tide has turned that doesn't mean there won't be pushback there won't be people who say we don't need to do that or there's a business reason why we don't do it but i i do think we're at a turning point yeah Fantastic. There is some great questions coming through. So I'm going to, yeah, Brian, did you want to add to that? No, no sorry. I'm, I'm hearing things. Um, so there has, so one of the questions was about those structural issues. Uh, there was another question about how important is it for people to understand the link between sexual harassment, gender-based violence and gender equality in the work context. So 
this conversation and I know Brian that you have your eyes on sort of not just preventing sexual harassment but promoting gender equality um, how do you think in terms of both uh, your workplace and the broader community people understand the link between those two things because our inquiry found that that on the current uh, current Australian landscape, gender inequality was the biggest power disparity that drove sexual harassment. So, Brian, do you think people understand, and what are you doing about that kind of side of the equation? Yeah, well, Marion will be the expert here. Uh, I can only say that I see the evidence. Clearly, there's a linkage, and so you can't uh, just work on one of the the things. You got to work on them all. And so we do try to take an evidence based approach on what we do. I have a sexual violence uh, prevention unit now, which has expertise around how best practices, and they are interlinked. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I, I know that I want to do everything I can. I also know I'm not an expert. I'm an astronomer. Uh, and so I'm going to actually let Marian answer the question from a piece of expertise point of view. Well, um, you did a pretty good job, actually. They are interlinked. There's no question about that. And uh, we have to address all aspects of gender equality in universities. I can't speak for every university, but I can speak for my own, that there, there certainly has been um, deliberate purposive action to address some of the gender, gender inequalities in leadership, for example. Um, but of course, it, it's across the board. It's really hard to make um, complete change in one institution without recognising that there are factors beyond the institution itself. So um, we do have to address all of those. I am a great believer that in policy and change, we change behaviour and attitudes. So we, you know, if we make a policy that says we won't put up with X behaviour and we stick to it as leaders do and, and should, then that does signal that you can't, can't do that and you won't be promoted on the basis of your work if you have behaved like that. Um, so this becomes a, a really important part of all actions within a university or any workplace. So it's, it's not just setting up the policies, but it's being aware that they have to align across the board. So one of the other questions, um, thank you for that, and that's um, fantastic. So one of the other questions was talking about that increase, and I think Brian, you've referenced this, within the student space, the expectation is that specialist staff with trauma-informed training will be promoted and available to students. Uh, uh, are there good examples of this approach in the staff space? So thinking about employee assistance programs or, so I'm really conscious of that recognition, uh, again, for universities about students. Uh, but I know, I know when we did uh, the Change the Course research, actually it was pretty consistently raised with me that could we do the same work for staff? And as it turned out, we did. It became a national inquiry, but at the time that wasn't the purpose of that work. Um, so do you, in terms of your organisations, are you aware of sort of those sort of support services? I would say as a general comment across the inquiry, we didn't see the services, even the kind of integrity lines weren't very good at trauma-informed practices. You know, a whistleblower line that says tick whether you were sexually assaulted as a checker box was not, you know, it was a bit horrifying to us. Um, so I don't think it's the, been the norm, but any comments on a trauma-informed approach for staff? Uh, can I start, Marion? Mm, absolutely. So, uh, yeah, one of the problems is just numbers. So with students, we have a considerable amount of case. So it's, it's, it's pretty um, reasonable to have uh, a, a several person unit that's in with specialists in it. For my staff, uh, it's, it's not that it obviously doesn't occur, but the rate is much lower. So we do have a uh, staff counselor who is first line, first person you're supposed to call, who is trauma informed. And we have, for example, a uh, what we call a dean of staff, which is meant to uh, you know, figure out many things. Uh, and one of the things that they would do is to triage into someone who has that expertise. 
so that is how we deal with it. So I hope we capture it that way. Um, but the total number of cases we have, it would be difficult to have a full-time member of staff and their backup when they're on leave and stuff, uh, given the caseload at a university like ANU. But we try to have that capability there through, through the process I've talked about. Marion, do you want, and I'm just realized the time, so yeah. I might, I might um, and make last comments and Ryan, I'll let you make a last remark if you want one before we close. Just on the EAP, I think, look, I, I have to be honest, I don't know enough about the EAP programs in universities, but I do know that COVID has actually made them more important. So that's another interesting thing. I think it's an area that we really should be paying more attention to. And it's um, if we do outsource it for various reasons, as, as Brian has pointed out, universities usually have to, to specialists, but are, are they doing enough in that area? And have we really um, looked at the specific um, advice that they provide? Fantastic. Now, did you, uh, there, there's a couple more questions, but I, I won't throw them to you, but there's one from uh, asking about uh, Professor Bev mentioned prior research and our organisational focus on gender discrimination can take a step back. So I think if you and I, I can put something on my yeah, Twitter account, yeah. and you can as well. So if you follow us on Twitter, we can, um, we can give you some of those leads, including to UN Women, which I think turned 10 years in the last right. month. I'm a bad Twitter person, but it's on my website, so I can send, <laughs> and I can send the reference out for you. We did a nice summary of all the research. <laughs> Ryan, did you want to make any closing remarks? Um, I think for me, the most challenging thing in this space is the stuff that I know is happening, but I don't know is happening. Mm. And being able to get the things out of hiding so I know about them and I can deal with it, that ultimately requires trust, trust that I'm trying to generate. Uh, it requires empowerment uh, and I'm trying to em empower people. Uh, but there's still, I'm sorry, a lot of things that are hidden that I assume are there that I just don't know about. And so we have a long ways to go, I'm afraid. And having agile ways of trying to figure out how to get people to, to report the problems so we can act on them, to my mind, is a big, big piece of unfinished business. Fantastic. Marin, did you want to make a last remark? I'll just pick up on that point that we have to really work on this. It's about shifting the norms across the board so that those hidden behaviours are not even practised anymore because it, it's not seen to be appropriate anywhere. Um, and that, that, of course, is a, a big task, but I think we can do it. Fantastic. Thank you, both of you, for uh, your great contributions. The questions that are coming in, unsurprisingly, are fantastic. And I'm really sorry we haven't been able to answer them all, but I think we've had a good go at a number of their areas. Um, also, thanks to everyone who's attended. And I hope you'll help us promote uh, and implement respect of work. Uh, I echo Marion's, um, uh, I love our report, even though I wrote it. <laughs> I keep digging back in and I just found something in the Deloitte report, which is the last appendix today for a session I'm doing tomorrow. So it oh, keeps on giving. Um, we'll share information about the recording of this event on social media and I'd love it if you could reshare it. Um, and so just in closing, the Respect at Work report reflects that sexual harassment is a complex issue and there's no question our recommendations are accordingly numerous and wide ranging. But the core of what we're talking about couldn't be simpler. That workplace sexual harassment is not inevitable, it's not acceptable and it is preventable. So I really appreciate you taking time to join to help um, to consider how you might make a difference in Australian workplaces and particularly in universities. Uh, and making it a safer and a better workplace for all of us, particularly in a post-COVID recovery, more productive and respectful workplaces is going to be essential. Thank you so much for joining us.